I'm John Travis in Molumbimbi, New South Wales, on the 3rd of December, 2020, talking to Charles Davidson on the Mornington Peninsula, just south of Melbourne and Victoria. And we're actually in the same time zone. This is uh, good for me. Um, I met you, oh, almost, well, 12 years ago with the RMIT uh, Master in Wellness program and have been following your dream unfolding at this fantastic, I got to tell you folks, he has created the most fantastic hot spring spa on the planet. And I, I've seen a few and uh, we're going to find out more about that. But first, let's begin with what, who you are and why, what, what led you to your path becoming the first graduate of our program. And uh, I don't know much about your past, like where you were born, your parents, what childhood influences, siblings, uh, were you a nerd, a jock, you know, that sort of stuff. So let's go back to the beginning. Right. Uh, well, probably the beginning in my life was in fact, funnily enough, in this area. Some of my very early childhood memories were on the Mornington Peninsula. My family had a farm here and we lived, uh, yeah, we lived, uh, or we traveled here on weekends and holidays. Uh, I learned to ride horses here. I went camping here and uh, learned to, to, to really love this, uh, this area. So that was, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had donkeys, uh, Horse, as I said before, horses, uh, sheep, cattle. Uh, so we we had all you know chickens, you, you name it, all the all the things you can imagine on a farm. We had here. My mother uh, was a uh, um, uh, one of the number three of four kids, and um, and we yeah. You were number in three. My, uh, you were I'm number, number three. three. Yeah, that's yep, usually yeah, the silent three. one. You're not too silent. No, no. My wife's number three as well. Funnily enough, so uh, interesting. You know, uh, that, uh, and I had an older sister, an older brother, and a younger sister. So it's two and two. Mm -hmm. Which, in fact, uh, I've got four children myself, um, and I've got two older sons and two younger daughters who range between the ages of 23 and 17. So, Wow, you and, packed uh, them in there pretty thick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it came with the, uh, the beginning of the dream of the hot springs came at the same time as my son uh, arrived. Uh -huh. So he was, he was conceived at exactly the same time as the knowledge that uh, we heard about there being hot water on the Mornington Peninsula in this region. Um, and that was sort of due to a chance conversation in Japan in 19... I've lost your audio. Lost audio. You were in Japan and you heard about this in the Mornington Peninsula. Yes. Yep. I uh, I was speaking to a person in Japan who ha I used to work at the Australian Embassy in Tokyo for for a, a short time, and uh, for a few years. And when I was there one day in early 1997, I was having a a beer after work with the head of the Victorian State Office, our Australian Victorian State Office in um, in Tokyo. And he said, you're a bit too entrepreneurial to be a, a diplomat all your life. So uh, what do you, what's your dream? What would you like to do? And I said, well, I'd love to, I'd love to do hot springs because uh, five years before in Japan, I was uh, uh, visiting, I was actually studying in Japan and working for another company. And somebody took me to a hot spring and I had a, an epiphany moment when I, hopped in the hot waters and, and uh, had this dream with me. But then, you know, that, that started. But, uh, yeah, then when I had this conversation and I said, I'd love to do hot springs, he, his reply was, I think there's hot springs on the Mornington Peninsula. So, <laughs> so for me, where, you know, my whole childhood had been brought up on the Mornington Peninsula, 
for somebody to say that it was sort of like wow you know it was the beginning of what has really become a continuum of uh, sort of synchronicity moments uh, times when it looks like uh, your your life is uh, laid out before you and it's already preordained just about um, it you know my family has been on the morning to peninsula in this region since the 1840s Wow. And um, so they were yeah, here from really early days and uh, the seventh generation in Australia. And, um, and that's quite, quite profound when I think about it because seven has been a very important number for us in, in many, uh, many, many areas of our, um, our, our, our evolution and story, but uh, also ancient indigenous wisdom really talks quite strongly in many cultures about the importance of seven generations and mm -hmm. being the, um, being the, you know, I call it the conscious connection. I met my great grandmother who also met her great grandmother, which was seven generations beforehand. So you had this sort of living connection right back mm. seven generations. Wow. And um, they, they say that that's how far you have to think to care for your future and reflect on your past in terms of uh, not making the mistakes and not making, you know, community mistakes and lifestyle mistakes that could affect seven generations ahead. So this is the sort of line of yeah. thinking that you when And, um, you know, we follow, I really do follow that through here in, in our, um, our philosophies of a, as a business and our, um, how we, um, how we approach our connections to, to the environment, our connections to culture, our connections to community. Um, and, you know, you, you see when you come around our place, a lot of things are made of stone and they're made of, you know, natural materials. And um, that uh, materiality is, is very important and the timelessness of it as well to mm. a large, large degree where you're, you're following a, a, an, an ancient wisdom or just the, the ancient, um, you know, uh, materials, which are timeless. So in seven generations, the rocks are still the rocks, the trees are still yeah. the trees, the, you know, and, uh, and it, will, it will, you know, fit beautifully in the environment. For, but that itself is an art because it's so easy to become eclectic and it's so easy to grab ideas and thoughts and just throw them down without the context of bringing it into a whole. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, very profound. And of course, the water will still be the water. But I'm curious, uh, and I'm betting some of our uh, listeners, viewers will be, whether your original settler family were prisoners or guards or anything in between. <laughs> that's the Australian well, myth. <laughs> Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, funnily enough, on my uh, father's side, which is not actually the connection in this region, he, he was in Melbourne, but on my father's side, they uh, arrived um, on, a, on a ship called the Harmony and they arrived in 1828 and it was uh, Elizabeth. So uh, Elizabeth, uh, I think it was Davidson, but... Um, her, and she arrived in Hobart as a prisoner. So she was a, uh, she, she'd stolen some fabric to, for some reason in, in Scotland and got, uh, got, got the free ticket to Australia. Um, and on my mother's side, it was a man called William Balcom. And he arrived from, from England in 1824 as Australia's first colonial treasurer. Mm. So, and he, he, in fact, had before being posted to Australia, had been on the island of St. Helena. Um, and while he was on the island of St. Helena, he had a man called uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, who arrived <laughs> on St. Helena after losing the Battle of Waterloo and was, uh, was sent there. And Napoleon had nowhere to stay while he, while he was building Longwood, which was his final sort of resting place, his home for the last three or four years of his life on the island. And he lived with our family for three or four months or a couple of months, two or three months on the island of St. Helena. So, How did you learn that? That's something. Yeah, well, in fact, the uh, house 
that the family, when they moved to this region in 1842, so William Balcom's son, Alexander, came out with him on the ship and he moved to the Mornington Peninsula to a property called the Briars and uh, a generation of our family, one generation back, gave the property to the state as a museum. And it has a lot of Napoleonic furniture, has one of Napoleon's three desk death masks is here on display in the museum and um, other gifts, a guitar from Napoleon that was a gift from saying thank you to our family for, for when he was staying with them. So, um, yeah. He, uh, yeah, yeah. So that you, you learn the history because there's a museum, you know, donated I'll by check our it family. Out. And now, yeah. next time I'm down, I'll check it out. <laughs> so, uh, in, let's go. In back. fact, just to, just, just, just to complete that story, there was a um, uh, uh, Alexander and William Balcom, when they came out from, um, from Europe, brought some vines and ended up planting a vineyard at the Briars. Mm. And in the early days of starting our hot spring project, I uh, went to the Briars and I'd heard about one of the old vines still being alive. And I ended up finding the vine and we are now growing it out. So four years oh. ago, we planted the vine and we have original cuttings from a vine that's reputed to have been a gift from Napoleon Bonaparte to our family that's still alive. So we wow. have this living connection back seven generations and we are uh, growing it out here at Peninsula Hot Springs. So um, th hopefully this year we will be able to create our first vintage. Great. Well, I look forward to see that when I get down there next. <laughs> now, um, back to your childhood. Um, were you living in Melbourne and traveling to the farm on weekends or, or were you actually on the farm yeah. full time? No, we were living, uh, living in Melbourne. So I went to school and lived in Melbourne. Uh -huh. I uh, went to the same school right throughout my, my schooling life. So I went to a school called Melbourne Grammar. Um, and which is sort of what we call a private school in in England they call it public school. Public but, school. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, but it's a school you have to pay a lot of money to go to. So we were, um, you know, my, my family was uh, you know medium wealthy. You know, like they they, they weren't you know like like super high class, but beautiful. You know, we had a nice house and we had a went to a very good school and we had a farm and and. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel when I was quite young. So my first trip overseas was at the age of five to uh, Bali in, uh, oh. in about 1970. So that was uh, at a time when, as a five-year-old, the people in Bali had not, in, in some of the towns in, in the middle of Bali, had not seen white children with blonde hair. Oh. And, uh, and they'd come up and touch your skin and touch your hair and they couldn't believe it, you know, like it was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it was uh, you know, quite a, quite 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 an experience. You know, Bali is obviously very 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 different nowadays. But yeah, uh, that, Where, that what time, suburb? Uh, what what suburb of Melbourne were you in? Uh, I was in a suburb called Turak. Okay, yes, so, I know. which is a uh, it's sort of a, a, a leafy suburb. Um, you know, not fairly yeah. central. Um, but uh, my father had been there when he was a boy. And we actually ended up moving into um, his childhood house um, when I was about 14, I think, 14 or 15. Yeah. And, um, and they used to have acreage. It was slowly sold off, I think, but uh, it was still quite a, quite a nice size property. And, and I lived in what was the old um, stables because they had horses. Um, and in fact, when I was a young, young, young boy, um, I remembered having milk delivered by horse and cart and, uh, and they used to have the delivery van with groceries. So you didn't so much go, you could go yeah. down to the supermarket, but it was actually even before the supermarket, they had a, a delivery vans with, uh, with yeah. all the, uh, you know, your breakfast cereals and all of these things. And, and uh, a milkman delivered the milk every morning and the, you know, and the, in, on the horse and cart. And we had, uh, you know, horse poo on the, uh, on the, on the roadways. <laughs> I grew up with that too, except they were using old trucks in those days. We didn't have the horses. So what was right, school like see? for you? I'm older than you then, that means. 
No, actually, you're not. But <laughs> <laughs> come on, it's hot spring. I, think, I, I, was, I was born in 1935, and I'm getting younger every day. Well, the math that you just told me, uh, I think you were born in 65. <laughs> oh, was there a, you go. <laughs> that was when I graduated from college. So uh, what oh, was school like for you? What were you a uh, uh, good student? Oh, not, not, not a, a brilliant student. I, I struggled. I had dyslexia, so I wasn't very mm. good at reading. Um, in fact, one of my uh, most, uh, you know, um, challenging and probably most embarrassing moments of my schooling life was uh, when in year 11, so second last year, or it might have been year 10, I, uh, we were doing uh, reading out loud in the class and I just could not, my, my mind and, and eyes just could not, could not uh, you know, connect and I, I was trying to read and it just wasn't happening and that was just like, very, very humiliating. I actually never really got um, in those early days. And I went through university. Mind you, I did manage to get to Melbourne University. And so I, I you know, I, I somehow found a way, you know, and I think it was called hard work. You just had to really mm -hmm. put in the hours and, and you know, to, 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 you know, so it was never a breeze. It was the academic side was always hard work for me. Um, but, you know, when I, when I, performed I could do it so you know when I put in the uh, put in the effort um, but uh, any d extracurricular um, like sports music drama uh, uh, yeah I, well, I tried to play guitar a little bit but that wasn't very successful and it's about as good as my voice I might I might try and sing your song later on and make oh your, great no I won't okay. do that I won't do that to you <laughs> no no I um, I uh, yeah I played uh, tennis um, and I played rugby and went skiing. Our family were, were, were very fortunate to be able to uh, go skiing um, on a fairly regular basis. And um, so that was, um, that was good. Um, and what other activities? Uh, look, between that and the farm and going away with family, um, you know, I seem to seem to always keep very very busy uh, horse riding because I, I had a we had a horse at, at our farm and so um, that was uh, that was a part of the the full you know rounded picture was Melbourne uh, grammar co-ed or any girlfriends in the scene uh, well Melbourne grammar wasn't co-ed but I still managed to find girlfriends so I think I I uh, I think I was about uh, 15 when I had my first uh, sort of girlfriend, you know, like something like that, 15 or 14, something like that. And oh. I, uh, I, uh, I, yeah, had a, a, a lot of friends. And in fact, um, when um, it, it was a very memorable part of our life, we had quite a, uh, a group of people and they were quite a special group of um, friends from school, but there was probably six or seven schools that would uh, um, around Melbourne, uh, usually all of these, you know, what we call private schools, um, who sort of hung out together on weekends and caused havoc. Um, and that was probably from the age of 15 through to, you know, the end of school. And there was probably a group of, you know, maybe 150 people or something like that who would, uh, who would you know, descend on places and, uh, and, and uh, you know, have, have an incredible, incredible fun um you know and yeah that was a that was a very important part of your life because it, it taught you a lot about um socialization and um different personalities and and uh dealing with you know uh, being yourself as much as you could be in a social broader social setting um was mlc and, one of the uh schools that you connected with or oh, not one of the major ones. No, MLC, we did know a couple of people from there, but really you're talking about Melbourne Grammar, Scotch College, you know, uh, Lauriston, Merton Hall, St. Catharines, you know, the girls and boys schools. So, um, I, I a few Xavier, Xavier, you know, a few of these ones. So. I only know of MLC from both 
uh, my ex-wife uh, who had to, they couldn't escape from it. <laughs> they were locked in and back in the, in the 60s and uh, another friend. Uh, so I've heard stories about MLC in uh, private public schools. So um, what was Melbourne Uni like? What did you major in? And yeah, I did a uh, I did a commerce degree at Melbourne University, and um, I came back actually when I finished high school. I went and spent a year overseas. Mm. This was in 1984, and I studied German in Germany. So I went to a little town called Göttingen for four months, and then went and lived in Berlin uh, in um, 1984. So I was on the other side of the Berlin Wall before came down in 1989 and um, that was a you know an amazing experience to be living under in the height of the Cold War right in the the center you know the centerpiece of the of the chess game of the Cold War um, yeah. and you know and I'd travel travel around Europe uh, visiting um, visiting you know east east Germany and then Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and all, all of the, uh, you know, the, the countries uh, around that area, Poland. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was quite an uh, amazing time of um, reflection on you know, humanity and the way that we, we are and doctrines and, and ideas of freedom and oppression. Um, I stayed with a family in the Czech Republic one time um, we were in their house and uh, but it was in an apartment block and we were talking and they had to go shh, shh, keep your voice down because our neighbors will hear us and we might be you know the K KGB and our secret police might find out and then we can get in some very serious trouble so what were you talking yeah. about you must have been talking well, about freedom yeah 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 no because mm -hmm. right at that time it was it was the build up for um, breaking away from mm -hmm. you know breaking away from the Russian state and the oppression that had happened and and the talk was everywhere you know like uh, that that uh, you know it it was it was on the on the move um, mm. in fact it was funnily enough I went to uh, just a few years ago about five years ago I went to Iran and we're travelling with a friend in Iran somebody who I'd met who was actually a student studying. Uh, spas and spa culture and I got there to study hot springs and um, and I went and visited to visit hot springs around Iran and uh, the conversations we were having uh, in Iran were very reminiscent to the conversations mm. I was having in Eastern Amazing. Europe which yeah. was about you know the oppression and the need to break away and the fact that the you know there's, there's the power of a gun and these people in Iran, the normal people in Iran and, 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 and in you know, Eastern Europe were smart enough to know that just, you know, uh, just protesting can lead to death. So, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, if somebody's got a big gun, then you, you, you are oppressed and, uh, and you, you accept it. You know, one of my friends was uh, in Iran was, uh, in fact... Uh, beaten because she was wearing jeans you know like mm. by their secret police equivalent so their their, their religious police and mm. um and you know it's you know, it's very easy and you hear it in the mass media of um stereotyping all the people in a country and you you learn from those travels and having been yeah. to those countries at those times that 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 is one of the most dangerous things you can do is to put people into boxes and um blaming the people and not the regime and um and then you know having you know silly talk about throwing big bombs at the communities to wipe them all out or those type of ideas are just um you know quite uh, quite sad because they're not based on, yeah. on any understanding of the reality in the real world um you know it's it's uh so anyway that was an amazing experience at that time i came back from traveling i actually spent another two months traveling around uh united states as well at the end and uh had a uh was very fortunate that it was towards the end of a airline called the republic airlines and uh they were selling in europe passes one month 
open travel passes like you'd have for a bus company, like Grey, oh. Greyhound would have, mm-hmm. but they were doing it for flights. And you could just jump on any flight that you did. And I bought two of those at 300 US dollars a, a, a pass for a month of open travel, you know, based on, you know, you, you had to have seat availability. And um, I flew from one end of the United States to the other, back and forward, every, all around the United States for two months. Um, mm. And uh, really got to got to see the see a, a lot of different areas and places around uh, around the United States, and um, that was uh, you know uh, an eye opener to see you know the uh, the difference between you know abstract poverty and a lot of the trail people living in trailers to you know the extreme wealth and you know the the Getty Museum and the the uh, you know, just incredible wealth and incredible poorness living uh, living yeah. side by side, um, and uh, it's uh, you know, in some ways, I'm very thankful that that our society here, uh, are, you know, somewhat more egalitarian. I suppose we pay probably higher taxes. I, I, I'm assuming Definitely. you know that yeah. there's slightly higher taxes, but uh, considerably the higher of the monies. Yes, yeah. and the, but the distribution of the um, of the money is such that there's a safety net, and people have a basic standard of living, and that that even the very poor people here, you know, there, there's always exceptions, but usually the very poor people here are, um, you know, they get health care, they get stand, you know, the, the, the standard of living, the base standard is um, is actually a, quite a lot, uh, quite a lot better, I would think. Than, than what I was seeing back then, you know, in the United States. I know, States, so. uh, and, and it's gotten much worse, but I, tr- I live in the Bay Area when I'm in the States and the hmm. homeless encampments under the freeways in Berkeley and Oakland and everywhere, uh, it's just incredible. And I don't see any of that in Australia. It's, it's dramatically hmm. different. Plus the infrastructure, this is one of the first things I noticed when I came here is that the infrastructure is so much better the roads are better, the bridges are better, the uh, bike lanes, uh, the bike paths, uh, things that uh, it, it's, it's amazing that where the money is spent. And uh, mm. I'm not even sure if the Australians appreciate how, how much better it is. <laughs> anyway, uh, you got your degree in commerce. I did, uh, and I so I went. I went after that year of travel. I went and did a did three years at Melbourne University, and uh, I. You know, it it was fun, but it was never. You know, I didn't really feel like I started living until I, uh, you know, until after university. Um, I I didn't know what I was wanting to do until the final year of university. I, I had no idea. You know, I I, I uh, wasn't following the standard paths. Um, you know, you were getting opportunities to work for some of the big companies and work. You know, there was. You know, because it was quite a good university, um, it, it you had had opportunities to do all sorts of things, but it wasn't until my final year of university that I did a, a subject called Asian Traditions and Economic Modernization, and mm. it taught me all about uh, Japanese trading companies. And um, funnily enough, uh, William Balcom, who I was talking about before, my ancestor who came from, uh, who used to work for the British East India Company at St. Helena, and that's where you know, Napoleon came and stayed with them. They were in trading business. So, but I, I actually didn't know that at the point at university, but I, I liked the idea of uh, international connection and these Japanese trading companies, uh, which I learned about at this course. Um, they were, you know, bigger than 50% of the world's countries in GDP, their turnover of the, the one business. Um, you know, and um, it turned out that they're the, the three largest exporters in Australia. Of, of the three largest exporters in Australia, two of them were Japanese trading companies, one called Mitsui, the other one called Mitsubishi, and then the third largest exporter was a company called BHP, BHP Billiton now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Australia's largest company was not trading, not selling as much uh, from Australia, as two Japanese trading companies were doing. 
you know, and and this was this was uh, unknown, nearly, you know, like you just didn't didn't realise, but uh, they were our largest trading partner, and um, yeah, I was I I decided that that was going to be interesting, and I. You know, I literally uh, went to Collins Street where their offices were and walked, went up the elevator to their offices and went to the front reception and said, can I please speak to your personnel manager? And this was towards the end of university and, uh, and I asked for a job. So, and the first one I went into, Mitsui, which was the, the largest exporter, their, their personnel manager said yes and I met him. And he said, you should have made an appointment, come back some other time. And uh, so I, I, I took that rejection and then jumped on the tram, went up to Mitsubishi, did the same thing, asked for the personal manager. And an hour later, I had a, you know, I'd spoken to him and he called me back a week later and said, come in for an interview. And they tried to get me to finish university right then and start work, but they held the job open for four months for me. And I, uh, I started working for a Japanese trading company um, as a result of, uh, you know, knowing what you want to do and then going off and Go doing it, you know, which has actually been a constant theme in, in, in my life is the, the, uh, an idea and, uh, and turning ideas into reality mm-hmm. and, uh, and by, you know, just doing it. So um, perseverance has been probably the most... Uh, Determination and perseverance have probably been the biggest uh, biggest factors in my in my life. You just hard work, you know. Wow. So what uh, what were you doing for them, and uh, uh, how did you wind up in I, Japan? Uh, then? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was working as a uh, a trader in food products, so I used to help Japanese companies um, source fine products. So we'd usually get inquiries coming from companies in Japan who might need, you know, asparagus or they might want um, wines or various cheeses or uh, some wheats and grains. Uh, So, you know, I would at that point, I was exporting around 20,000 tonnes of cheese a year to Japan. Um, We were exporting milk powders and other dairy products. and um, yeah, and then a lot of, you know, there was some fish. So we did fresh salmon from Tasmania. Um, I was the first person to export ice cream from Australia to Japan. So I negotiated oh. the contract for that. Uh, it was with a, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go around and I'd have to learn when the inquiry came in, I'd have to go and find it, understand, research the market, which would be, you know, if it was an ice cream one, I'd have to look at all the ice cream manufacturers in Australia who had the capacity, who would be, and then contact them and find out whether they were interested in exporting and then um, start the to and fro between Japan and Australia, and our, our company in Japan and, and you know, the manufacturer in Australia. And, uh, and then you'd slowly work through samples and, you know, the, the taste and the recipes and in that case. Um, and that was the same with many things. So I, products like that. Um, so Did you, uh, it was an amazing Japanese? introduction. Uh, not in Australia. Oh, I started learning it a little bit in Australia. And I, but I realised that if I just stayed with the company as a local employee, I had no career. You know, it was interesting. It was great learning. It was great. Uh, you know, it, it was incredible. I mean, I was straight out of university and I was dealing with export managers and owners of companies um you know big australian manufacturing companies and i here i am you know i'm 21 years old and i'm you know dealing directly with people who are senior managers in their organization and uh, or owners of their organization so it was an incredible uh, to be able to rub shoulders with uh, entrepreneurs and 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 you know international business people um at the highest level straight away out of university so um that was that was very good. Now, what was your question? You just asked another uh, well, one. Uh, yeah. Whether you learn Japanese, it sounds like you're oh, yes. in Japan. Yeah, I uh, I I ended up um, I I ended up realizing that it was going to be hard to you know hit that glass ceiling as a local employee, and 
I learnt about a, um, a, a fellowship. I read about it in a paper about the Asia Pacific Fellowship, which was a state federal government fellowship to try and help executives of, you know, the right companies get to go to Japan or to Asia, you know, so a country in Asia. And uh, they, uh, I, so I got our, um, our general manager of our branch, the Melbourne branch, to support an application for us to get a, a fellowship. And um, it basically paid for my year in Japan. Um, and the company, he, he, he arranged for the company to support it. And then I ended up going to Japan and working in our food department um, in Tokyo. So I went to the Tokyo head office on an Asia Pacific fellowship. And, um, and part of it was learning Japanese. So I had to spend six months in language school. So it was a combination of language school in the morning and then work in the afternoon. And, and I did that for six months and then worked. And then they extended my stay in Japan by another period. Um, so I ended up having 18 months in Japan. But um, and learnt Japanese while I was there. Um, it was quite a challenge because working for Mitsubishi in uh, in their head office in Tokyo, you were um, they'd never had in the you know since eighteen sixty eight or whatever it was in Tokyo when Mitsubishi was formed, um, they'd never had a foreign person working in their mm. head office in the food department. They had in some other departments, but they'd never had that in the food department. So it was a, a, a cultural a challenge for a number of the Japanese because, you know, it was, it was you know, sort of uh, pushing the bounds of what is normal. Um, so some people gave me a hard time and, and you know, but, but look, amazing experience to be able mm. to be working at, at, at the top level. Mind you, Mitsubishi... Uh, had been at that point, and I think it has continued, been the number one dr draft choice, you know, number one choice of graduates from universities in Japan for 20 years. Mm. So Mitsubishi Corporation, so the company I work for. And uh, interestingly, they said Mitsubishi, which means three diamonds. So that's the shape of the Mitsubishi, the cars oh, and all of those things. That. It's ah. Mitsu is three and Bishi is a diamond. And they say this group, this big group, the Mitsubishi group, the three diamonds of the group are the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, which is the muscle, Mitsubishi Bank, which is the, the money, and then Mitsubishi Corporation is the brains. Mm. And so between those three, between the muscle, the brains, and the money, you have a lot of strength. So that was how that's how the Mitsubishi guys, the Mitsubishi Corporation guys like to think about it anyway, because they, you know, they like to think of themselves <laughs> at the top. You know, so anyway. <laughs> Fascinating, it was, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, I, I've been eternally grateful for Mitsubishi for opening up my, you know, bringing, uh, enabling me to do something uh, new, you know, that, that hadn't been done before in that organization. And then to having the opportunity to, you know, visit a hot spring and, um, and you know, the rest of it, life is. Uh, is is what's happened you know they, it was an epiphany moment jumping in that water um yeah it was incredible. So that was uh, fairly soon out of school then when that happened right uh, uh well i was at mitsubishi for in melbourne for about five years four years five four five years nearly before i so i, I finished university in uh, 19 what was that 19 uh, 1987, I think it was, yeah, four, five, six, seven, yeah, 1987, and then I made it to Japan in 1992. Mm -hmm. So, so you 1992. Had the, so yes, yeah. You had the epiphany, and then uh, what? Uh, what did it take to uh, lead to the? Uh, I know you traveled all over the world to explore hot springs before you started yours, or I believe that's what. I remember. Yeah, well, sort of. It was a, a bit of a bit of a combination, but I did. I um, I ended up. Um, in, in fact, funnily enough, talking about the food industry, I, I used to be very thankful. I mean, I, I'll come back to you know what 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 brought me into hot springs and why why. But um, one of the one of the core 
rationales for me choosing Hot Springs or the epiphany moment was that I had um, earlier on in my, my career, I, when I was working in the food industry, I used to thank my lucky stars that I wasn't dealing in, in meats, you know, where mm -hmm. uh, when I had clients who, who came I, um, and came and visited, I'd take them around dairies and, and you know, and visit the cheese making and then I'd go to wineries and, and I used to love the idea that we could milk the cows and the cow stayed alive, we'd have our cheeses and we'd have our commerce and then we could squeeze the grapes and the vine would stay alive, we'd have our wine and we'd have our commerce and so you could, you, you, you could exist in this, you know, a, a very balanced place. And, um, but then when I jumped in those thermal waters in the middle of, you know, it was at the end of winter in Japan, but there was snow all around. And um, it was in a town called Kusatsu in the, you know, a couple of hours out of Tokyo. And um, I lay back in those waters and just felt, you know, at one with the environment, at one with everything. And I suddenly felt, well, this is even more gentle than milking the cow or squeezing the grape is putting people into warm water. And so it was then that I said, well, this is what I'd love to do. I'd love to bring this culture of bathing to Australia and to our home because, you know, for, for me, and I think it's for most people, we, we try and find our purpose in life. You know, we try and find what it is mm -hmm. that we're meant, we're here to do and what it is that we can do to make other people happy, you know, and, and, and contribute to the, to, to, you know our society our community uh, and humanity if you can if you're lucky enough and um and you know so knowing this culture was so strong in japan and seeing it and seeing how beautiful it was and also understanding that we didn't have it in 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 the melbourne that i'd grown up with i um i just felt it uh it, it was a mission so i started my uh, started on the mission then in 1997 when I jumped in that water, but it wasn't until five years later when I'd quit Mitsubishi and I joined the Australian Embassy and then I had that discussion with uh, the Kevin Knowles, who was the head of the Victorian State Office, and he mentioned that there was hot water on the Mornington Peninsula. So, so it, was, uh, you know, it was the beginning of those serendipity moments where you know, somebody says things that just happen and it just happened to be in the backyard of the place that my family had been for seven generations. Um, really? It was right there? And, well, not on our property. It was on the region, in the, in the uh -huh. region. You know, like, so it's not, it wasn't actually on our land. I had to, we had to go and yeah. I got my brother involved and told him about the idea and, and said, do you want to come into business with me? And, uh, you know, he thought about it for a, a, a few weeks and then came back and said, yes, let's do it. And then, you know, at the end, by the end of 1997, we'd found the block of land and uh, near, near where what happened to be an old government test bore, um, that the government had been doing test drilling right across the state of Victoria, just looking for water resources and checking the water tables and water resources. And they came across this hot water. And that was back in, you know, 1979 when they were doing that checking. And uh, a report was written in 1984, a few years later, and sent to Japan. Somebody must have thought maybe we can get some investors in hot springs or something in Japan. And Kevin Knowles had that report in 1984, but it wasn't until, you know, 1997, so all those years later, that... I asked that question or answered his question about hot springs and he remembered the report that it came across his desk all those years before. Oh, amazing. Now, yeah. uh, there wasn't Just a natural spring. It wasn't a natural no. spring. It's through a bore. It's, it's bore water. Yeah, the one we have oh. here you know, on the Mornington Peninsula, we had to drill down 600 metres and uh, it's 54 degrees Celsius down the bottom. Um, and by the time it gets to the top, it's 46.2 degrees. And that temperature has not changed in the last 15 years. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very plentiful resource of natural mineral thermal water. Um, it's, it's unlike the one we now have a hot spring in New Zealand, um, which we bought about five years ago. And um, with some other 
partners that we bought it with, but we're the primary shareholder. Um, and um, that one is a pure natural hot spring that comes out um, in the mountains of the South Island of New Zealand. It's the largest natural flow rate of a hot spring in the South Island. Wow. And, uh, and it's just on the Maruria River. It's called Maruria Hot Springs, and it's, it's an incredible location. You know, yeah, we were just 6, there the last feet to, yeah, we yes. just had the last two we, years. I would have known, uh, like to have known about it. What, what part, uh, in relation to uh, the glaciers is it, uh, on, on the uh, well, it's a bit up from the glaciers. It's, uh, if you, it, from Christchurch, if you go inland and then you go to Hamner Springs and then you go on the Lewis Pass, so you can go on the Lewis Pass over over the mountain ranges and it's right in the middle of the mountain range so it sits in the middle of a you know two two hundred thousand hectare national park and it's uh, wow. one little a little uh you know what would it be uh, 1.5 or two hectare you know five acre six acre block of uh land private land in the middle of a national park with mm. a hot spring yeah it's uh I'll check it out it, yeah, it's, it's very, very amazing and, and quite incredibly out of COVID and all the situations we're in right now. Um, you know, New Zealand did a very hard lockdown and then sort of effectively eradicated COVID from the country. And, um, and that, that business, uh, while it was closed for six weeks, it did a huge amount of work and renovation. And they reopened and now they're trading at somewhere between 70 and 80 percent up from the same time last year mm. so right. they've actually done very very you know very very well out of um out of this situation that particular business <coughs> fascinating now um, i'm curious about the travels where you uh what other places before you opened yours i'm the ones i know are harvin hot springs and wilbur and a, a few yeah. around the states. I assume you were there, and you know that Harbin burned down. But uh, we yeah, were there. yeah, we were there last month, and the pools are all up and running. But they're uh, they're working on bringing that back. It's sad though. The big old buildings. Oh, so the right. So th so the birthplace of Watsu. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm. And I think that whole big center up on the hill is gone. Um, we didn't have access to it, but the main pools down below the uh, the really hot one above the the median pool is all back to normal. So uh, okay, yeah, yeah, they're, uh, they're yeah. I I have been there and I met um, Harold Harold Dahl. Is it the um, I think it is the the, the founder of Watsu. Oh yes, I, Harold Dahl. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. I uh, was very fortunate to meet him one night there, and uh, we we caught up and had a conversation because he's a you know a, a, one of those uh, those uh, amazing water people who've uh, who followed the uh, followed and shared a story of uh, an activity, a, a way of us connecting through through waters, um, and um, but I yeah in the states I've been you know all the way around you know, different areas in the States, not everywhere. I mean, the States has got so many thousands of hot springs. So it would take, uh, you know, it'd be a bit like trying to see all the hot springs in Japan nearly. <laughs> um, it, uh, in fact, I think, you know, it, of all the countries in the world um, that have huge potential for the hot spring industry, and it's, it is about to, you know, really, really start to start to grow. I think, you know, United States is, um, it, it, it has, has just incredible potential. And only because um, it's got an incredible resource. You know, it's gifted. The, the hot springs right across the country are there, you know, whether it's New Mexico or whether it's uh, California or, you know, you know, look right through Oregon. Um, you know, all, 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 there's so, so many beautiful places. Um, well, growing up there, I wasn't aware of them until I moved to California, like in Ohio, uh, where I grew up, I don't think there are any, but there could be, and I don't know about them. But what would be some yeah. of the most outstanding uh, ones that that you uh, discovered, and how that shaped your vision? Uh, 
Well, look, probably for, for me, I mean, uh, one's in, you know, J- Japan was uh, clearly the, the, the probably the biggest early influence. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, you know, I've been to literally hundreds and hundreds of, uh, if not thousands of hot springs in Japan. Uh, you know, I lived there for six years altogether. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I went to many, 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 many uh, places tr- driving or riding motorcycles or catching trains or whatever to get there. Um, one of the biggest things that I learned from Japan is the, uh, the connection to nature. So mm-hmm. the beautiful designs and the, and, you know, the, the simple essence of the, that, that connection um, to the waters and to the environment around you. Um, but the other ones of big influence, um, I went to Yemen very early on, 1998. I did a trip where I went to Russia, st- did a spa course in the Czech Republic in the Kalo Vavari and Marian Skalanske. So just a couple of, um, of, of fairly famous spa towns. Uh, and uh, Kalo Vavari is Karlsbad is the other, other name for it. Um, and um, and I, I yeah, did a, a, a very influential spa course there. And then I hopped on an aeroplane and went to Yemen. Um, and in uh, Yemen, I, I made a choice to go to Yemen because I had a, a theory, and this is in the, the look for trying to understand and build a hot spring culture in Australia, which was the, the goal. I had a theory that um, hot springs as a, a nature's gift um, was something that had nothing to do with the money economy particularly and that any country that had hot springs would have a culture around it. So you didn't mm. necessarily have to be rich or poor. You didn't have to be any certain, you know, it wasn't actually an economic driven thing. It was a nature's driven thing and it was because it felt good. Um, and so that was a theory that I had when I was in Japan. And to test the theory, I, I, uh, picked up the Economist magazine in Tokyo and chose the poorest country in the world, which was at that point Yemen and had a GDP per capita, and this was in 1998, of uh, 320 US dollars per capita per annum. Um, mm. So less than they were living on less than a dollar a day. And um, I uh, went, went to... You know, and it just happened that Yemen, mind you, there was no thing, there was nothing called Google, there was no, uh, there was no Facebook, and there was no, you know, there was an internet, but really everything was fax back at that time, and it was just by fortune and 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 uh, and luck that uh, Yemen had one consul in all of the southern world, well, all of the Asia Pacific region, and uh, that was in Tokyo. So I could go to the consul and then find out about travel in Yemen, and um, I found a travel company, and they gave, and I um, organised a hot spring tour of Yemen, something they'd never been asked for before. Mm. And I, uh, but when I was there, I travelled around and did visit uh, Damth, which is one of the old hot spring towns, and um, that town was actually a healing town where they'd have people would stay for a week or two and be taking the waters every day. Mm. And uh, they'd have certain times for women and certain times for men in these natural springs. And, um, you know, there was this, this whole healing modality. I also went to uh, the, uh, the, one of the big bathhouses in uh, Sana, the capital of uh, Yemen, and that one was 2,200 years old. And still operating. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so that was very profound because, you know, you're thinking, you know, we, we, we use even our, our calendar is based on, you know, the birth of Christ. And, you know, this is, you know, 2020. This was 1998 and it was already 2,200 years old then. So, you know, it's 2,200 mm. and whatever it is, 30 years old now. Um, mm. And, uh, and it, was you know 200 years before Jesus even walked on Earth, people were bathing in these in these hot springs, mm. and uh, in the te- in the in the country where the Queen of Sheba was born, and the 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 three kings came from came from Yemen, oh, and they got their frankincense, their gold frankincense and myrrh, and uh, funnily enough, 
the fame that came from the frankincense ended up leading to the cutting down of all the forests in Yemen. Oh. Yeah, because people wanted to get the essence and the smell and the frankincense, and so they ended up cutting down all the forests. And uh, the only way... I, le I learned all of this because the, uh, the bathhouse, they had to heat the bathhouse because they still wanted to bathe, even back at that time. And, um, and even though their forests weren't there, what they were doing was they had somebody's job was to dry human feces out in the desert and bring it back in and burn it in the, at the back end of the furnace. Huh. And that's how they heated that, because that one wasn't a hot spring in the centre of Sana. There were hot springs in other parts, but that one was a bathhouse, but it was heated by, by, uh, by human feces. It, not now. Now they've moved to gas, I think it was, or something like that. But, but, uh, but, but in, traditionally, when they uh, finished cutting down all the forests because everybody uh, venerated the, uh, and, and, and sought, sought after all the things that the, the, king, the king was given as gifts... Uh, that uh, the king being, you know, Jesus, uh, was given as gifts, he uh, ended up <clears throat> destroying the very environment from which it was coming. So, um, which yeah. is, uh, you know, very paradoxical in a world that we live in now where we yeah. uh, are chasing ourselves to oblivion, they're saying, you know? Yes. Yeah. So um, Our, you, let's, let's go to uh, your actually early days of starting when did you uh, break ground and uh, I know when I first mm. saw it 10 or 12 years ago it was we, we met in uh, our we had a staff meeting at a tent up uh, up the hill and there were a few buildings mm. but it was uh, how did it grow and uh, uh, one one, uh, one one bath at a time I think you'd <laughs> say we uh, we we drilled in uh, what we, we finally got the water out because there was a whole drama and story around you know it took us eight years from when we bought the property to to being able to start a business so we bought mm. the property in 1997 and then we opened in 2005 um and um you know there was all it seemed like a long time now it, it, it you know with knowledge and time you you, you realize that a lot of these things do take many many years to 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 gestate and to find their find their their uh, their future, um, but um, we you know developed this master plan by travelling around the world, and that was the idea of going to Yemen and Russia and and Japan, and I flew to America and went to all these you know Canada and um, all these different countries because we wanted to incorporate in our design um, our master plan design and. Um, something that would uh, bring back essences from all the different cultures or many different cultures around, around the world and uh, weave it into the nature that's here, but using um, what knowledge we could gain and, and gather from you know, the ancient cultures of the world. Um, and, um, and that's pretty much what we've done. So we've built, uh, um, built you know, facilities. We started off with what, uh, you know, while we had the master plan, which is 126 rooms of accommodation, and it's got a wellness centre, and it's got, you know, all, um, you know, function centres and, and many different pools and a spa centre and various food outlets and so forth. Um, while we had that at the beginning, we had a big dream, but we didn't have a big wallet. So we started off with the smallest thing that we could possibly build um, that we considered we could possibly build and be economically viable. And that way, the, uh, the logic of that was to, um, to be able to, you know, own a good enough share of it ourselves um, and yet have a business that, that works. So, um, and so we built what we now call today the Spa Dreaming Centre. It had, you know, 10 pools. There was uh, three indoor and two outdoor private pools and five outdoor private pools, a sauna, a, uh, you know, and a little cafe and uh, how many was it? Four or five, five massage rooms. Um, so that was the, the complete thing. And really from, for, to start with, from 
cost around three and a half million dollars, I think, back then to, to build it. Um, and, um, and, you know, from day one, um, we, were, we were being, um, you know, uh, well frequented. So, you know, it was, it was actually cash flow positive from the very beginning. Um, mm. You know, so that was very thankful. Um, I think our story, we had spent a lot of time, you know, over those eight years, you know, it, it had become a, 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 a quite a, a, quite a story of these crazy lunatic boys trying to do a, you know, do something, <laughs> do, do, do a, you know, people thought you were just a bit, a bit silly. They, they didn't, you know, they, they really uh, doubted, doubted the whole thing. And many people did that, which, you know, happens and, you know, ha happens quite often in life, but uh, like anybody who starts something new, you know, you, um, you, you, you've just got to keep plugging away and you've got to yeah. believe in your dream. And, and because I knew it and I'd seen it in other countries around the world and I, and I was learning more and more about the culture I, uh, of bathing and I could see how profoundly important it was for um, the communities in which it, it, they were located as, as places of connection and places of relaxation, health, well-being, and um, but you know more so than anything of of where friends and you know friends and lovers can meet and relax and be be together and and um, and and you know enjoy um, just being you know I, I like to think of it as the capital just to be you know mm -hmm. it's a, um, important for yeah. doers to to become beers yeah so yeah. Now I know that you I also think, had I a think larger... it's important for doers to do, actually. Yeah. Well, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you done did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I know that uh, you also had a vision of the whole Mornington Peninsula being a, a wellness uh, destination. Well, I want to back yes. up and find out when you first heard the word wellness, because. It wasn't uh, in the vernacular in the States until the 80s. Uh, and then it, it became synonymous with the dog food company and all kinds of yeah. weird other things. Uh, what what was your first encounter with this weird word that I originally thought wasn't I, even going to fly? I, um, I think it, I, I'm pretty sure I can't really remember it 100%. It was... Um, it, might have been, um, well, because it was in our first master plan, which we got approved in, you know, uh, well, the final stamped approval was, it took us till about 2002, but the application would have gone in, in 1999, something like that, 1990, yeah, about 1999. Um, and that has had, a, it's still got a wellness centre on it. What, what we call the wellness center. Um, the, the businesses that I'd seen of like that were um, in our travels and in the studies in the early days were, you know, um, like the Golden Door and whether that's the Golden mm -hmm. Door in the United States or it's um, uh, the, a similar name, Golden Door, um, in Australia, up in Queensland, um, mm -hmm. so, you know, southern Queensland, uh, a guy called... Brooke Ramage had been involved in starting that, um, and um, or you know uh, that that was sort of those times that I was first hearing about those type of centres, wellness centres. Um, you know, you had your Red Door, in which is more like a spa centre, um, and yeah, so it was way back uh, in nineteen late nineteen nineties. Um, mm -hmm. is when I would have, um, um, you know, really started to put that into the mix of what we wanted to incorporate at, at the Springs. Um, I, um, yeah, yeah. So, we're, and, and look, we do see ourselves very much as a wellness uh, destination, a wellness uh, provider, um, even though a lot of it is um, very passive. And I think uh, the energetical difference between um 
you know, the activities is very important. And I think that's one of the most important parts of the uh, initial triage that we have with guests. And this was, we've only just started accommodation two days ago on, on Tuesday. Oh. It's Thursday wow. now. So it's uh, two days ago we started our first accommodation, just 10 rooms. But as we uh, uh, move in, I think one of the skills that we uh, have to learn and uh, evolve it will be that initial triage where we work out is this person looking for active wellness or passive wellness mm -hmm. are they are they really needing just quiet rest and doing nothing which is often the most important thing for people mm -hmm. to, to actually to turn off or do they really want to start to learn other things are they already ready and um here to to learn about, you know, hot and cold therapies or clays and muds or about, uh, um, you know, re reflexology or spa treatments or all the other uh, meditation, mindfulness and all the other, other you know, elements of a, a broader conscious wellness offering or an active wellness offering. And, um, you know, that, that for us is going to be very important because we're not, um, eventually we will end up having a wellness center that does, and we do have a wellness center, but as a, a, a wellness program for overnight guests to be able to, um, you know, come on a wellness retreat. At the moment, we offer our overnight guests um, a fire and ice, so that's a hot, cold therapy, saunas and an ice cave. And then we also offer them a clay experience and then we offer them uh, morning yoga. So that's just included in a, a basic mm -hmm. package. Um, but that's different. They're, they're sort of like, uh, you know, it's active but passive and it's optional. Whereas if you came on a program where you were, you were a, it was a pre-programmed um, offering, then it becomes really active wellness and uh, positive, you know, posit mm -hmm. positive uh change that you're seeking mm. yes now i'm curious when um uh, you got involved with the rmit program and you probably met mark i'm suspecting he <clears throat> might have had something to do with you getting into that and uh how that relates to the larger picture of your vision of of the uh, whole mornington peninsula uh, and where that is uh well look I, I actually met Mark. Um, and I'm talking about Mark Cohen, just for the record, uh, who was the yes, founder yes, yes. of this program. And, yeah. Absolutely. Professor Mark Cohen, who, who was a, a medical doctor, he's got three PhDs and he's a, a, a very, very intelligent man who, um, who has, to date, he spent 14 years as a professor at RMIT where he, he, was, he got a professorship there and started the Master of Wellness program the first one on the, in the world, um, which uh, unfortunately has, was closed down a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, and Mark uh, decided that, uh, to uh, move on to other, other things just in the last year or so. Um, and uh, he's doing some amazing things. That's another whole story and a different person to talk to. Um, <laughs> he's on my list. I, uh, I, I met Mark Cohen because he, he had heard about this crazy guy who was digging holes in his backyard <laughs> and, and building baths and trying to build a hot spring. And he, uh, he uh, loved baths and loved water and water, you know, water things. And, um, and so he came and visited me. He actually was, uh, I think he heard about me from a guy called Neil Hoffman, who used to run Ontos Retreat, which is one of the very first uh, retreat centres in Australia, up in the mountains of uh, northeast uh, Victoria. Uh, well, not north, so eastern Victoria. And um, he, he uh, yeah, that was a, a, a retreat centre. And Mark had done some work up there and with, um, you know, as a... Uh, as a medical student, but also as a, as a teacher. Um, um, I actually didn't complete the Master of Wellness program. I did uh, four or five of the subjects. I got close, but I also had four children and a, a young business. And I, I just decided uh, 
all that learning about wellness was about finding about balance and trying to find balance in your life. And, and uh, I was finding that to, to put in the hours to, to the study compared to the hours that I needed to concentrate on my children and my, uh, my, uh, my, my business that I, uh, I couldn't complete it. It is a, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm so glad that I did what I did. Um, I have been fortunate enough to be a very close friend of Mark's for, you know, what's close to 20 years now, um, you know, 16, 17 years. And uh, we have traveled together um, all over the world, you know, from Turkey to climbing, doing Everest space camp walk together. To, oh, you were on that too. Uh, I remember when he did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so we have had many times to ponder, discuss and dream about, um, dream about, um, you know, facilities and what can we offer and what can we build. And so really a lot of what we have built here is a product of travels and learning just, and many, many discussions with people like Mark um, and yourself, in fact. Oh, lost audio. Yeah, so my, um, those discussions and all the things we've been building and the relationships with people like yourself and Mark Cohen have been very much a, uh, an, an, a, a, a very important influence um, and uh, on, on, you know, what we build, how we, how we evolve and, and, you know, and how we thoughtfully connect uh, with a, a purpose for our business and our purpose, you know, within the community for the business. And, um, and I, I think, you know, it's something um, continually connecting with the um, thoughtfulness and the mind um, and study is something that we've always done. And, you know, right now we are sponsoring two PhDs at um, one at uh, Victoria University and one at RMIT in the hot spring industry to help, you know, evolve knowledge and understanding um, of, of the hot spring industry. And, mm. um, and, you know, and I can, I, I, I think that will continue on as long as, you know, as long as I'm involved here, I will be certainly promoting and encouraging a, um, this uh, thoughtful connection about, you know, um, learning, you know, that learning is an important part of mm -hmm. growth and, and health and well-being, you know. So Now, uh, I remember yeah. when you had a vision to draw in various uh, uh, local businesses and um, I'm wondering if you encountered resistance and people get wellness. I mean, I had to struggle a lot even to get people to spell the word right. But how's it been <laughs> with the with that vision uh, look i think in terms of connecting on a commercial level um and when i say that is we have packages with about 140 different operators on the oh. you know uh, other businesses so in that sense it's been you know very successful um and they're um connecting because they might own you know i think about 50 of them are accommodation providers Mm. And you've got people who are doing, you know, golf courses or horse riding or uh, dolphin swimming or all these different activities. And we do a, you know, a dine and bay, the swim and bay, the stay and bay, uh, all these different packages we have with other businesses, which link back this wellness activity, often with other activities, which are quite, you know, wellness activities. It's sort of being out and into life and engaging with, you know, being active. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, movement uh, and, and healthy, healthy living, healthy eating is a very, very important part of wellness and doing it mm -hmm. in a nice environment. So doing it in, you know, in where we are now, which is not in a polluted city, it's in the, in the countryside and near the ocean. Uh, you know, you, you, you actually have a very good base from which to do all these activities. Um, so I think that while, you know, we haven't been, you know, saying, come do a wellness activity, ride and bathe, you know, we don't use the word wellness as the promoter, 
but the activity you are doing and sort of or, or almost subliminal mm-hmm. wellness. So you are, you are delivering the product, you are just making it very simple and easy for people to access it. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, you know, uh, it, it, maybe there isn't so much a need to get caught up in the semantical idea or the need that people need to understand the meaning of a word according to me. And really, there's probably more importance that people get engaged in doing the activities. And then they may wake up one day and call it wellness or they just call it life. And does it matter? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. You know, now, it's about with, developing healthy habits and, you know, healthy ways of being. With, with all this uh, uh, career development and your dream uh, coming to fruition, you also had four <laughs> kids. Your oldest son was... Uh, born on the same time as mm. and uh, so how is your do you have time for a personal life your, your kids see much of you I think they actually see me but they see me at a desk a lot uh-huh. so I am at home I mean like most nights I will be at home particularly now doing shutdown it's particularly good I'm not traveling overseas at all um, so they see me more now than they have before but but I'm at home very often for dinner and we sit down and have dinner together. Um, but, you know, often before dinner, I'm, you know, a, 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 a arriving from work and then we have dinner together. And then after dinner, I, uh, you know, we wash the, wash the dishes and then, you know, very often we go back, they go back to their studies and I go back to my study and we you know, get back into the other extracurricular activities we have. Um, we have connected a lot on travel, so it's something that we have managed to be able to do, and I think that's probably the the real strength of our family and how we are able. To, it's been um, it's good, and I see it with my kids. I, I think I'm fortunate. I got two older boys and two younger girls because really we had a house full of um, of, of uh, you know um, teenagers, all, all uh, sexually maturing at the same time. So there was a lot of uh, hormones running around our house at a certain <laughs> stage then, but. Um, yeah. but, uh, but what it also meant is that, that, that they all could relate to each other quite well. And having older boys and younger girls, it wasn't like often when you have a much older girl and then you have younger kid, boys, the boys are really immature and the girl's too old. Yeah, so they, yeah. You never have that, that sort of friendship connection. You'll have the brotherly connection, but not also the friendship connection. But I think my kids have all got a, a friendship connection. We've also been able to achieve that through a lot of travel. So we have, uh, you know, done many trips around Australia together, whether it's, you know, driving from Darwin back to Melbourne or travelling around um, the outback and, you know, on road trips and this and, you know, on, um, you know, all, 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 all sorts of trips around Australia. We've travelled um, to Japan many times together. We lived in Japan in 2013, so I took a gap year with uh, my wife and... and um, and all the four kids and they all went to school in Japan and wow. we had a whole year there. So we, uh, wow. we lived in Niseko for, um, and I mean, Hakuba, not Niseko, when I talk about Hakuba, which is um, in Nagano. And that was a, a ski town where they had the Winter Olympics there some time ago. And um, we lived there for one ski season and then moved to Tokyo for the rest of the year. And, um, yeah, the kids all went to local schools. Um, so that was, uh, you know, an amazing life experience. How did um, they manage that, lo- going to a local school? Did they have, have any Japanese before then or they just got thrown in? The- well, it was a bit, of, a, a bit of both. They had some Japanese before. We'd taken all the kids before then had, in, had spent some periods of time in Japan um, oh. at school. They'd also, every Saturday morning, my wife mainly, Yuki mainly, and myself sometimes would take them to Japanese Saturday school for language school for, which was, you know, a school designed for expat Japanese families living in, in, in Australia, but trying to keep the kids up to date with their language. So when they went back to Japan that they could, uh, wow. they could somehow, you know, keep going. So they did that every Saturday. So that was a real chore for the kids. They, they, you know, from 
from an early age they were going to Japanese school every Saturday, so they do six days a week of schooling. So, which, um, yeah. I, so I so look, we did a lot of work. I, I I missed an important piece in your unfolding of when you met your wife, mm -hmm. and I've just figured out from her name that she's probably Japanese. So I'm guessing. Yeah. Let's go back and fill in that gap that I, I missed. Okay. Well, that one was uh, uh, Yuki. So her name is Y-U-K-I, Yuki, which means noble freedom in Japanese. And uh, she, uh, we met each other at work. So she worked at the Australian Embassy in Tokyo, um, mm -hmm. basically doing the same job as I was doing. And I was actually employed at the Australian Embassy as a local employee. Um, but I was on a diplomatic visa. So um, it was a, a bit of a loophole. It was actually very interesting because they, they say in life there are two things that, uh, that you get you, that, that are certainties, and that's death and taxes. And I had uh, three and a half years when I worked at the embassy because they, they uh, gave me a job as a local employee that I applied for, even though I was an Australian citizen. So they had to give me a diplomatic visa, but I was a local employee. And the, uh, the Australian tax office can't tax local employees. <laughs> and the Japanese tax office can't, can't tax people on <laughs> diplomatic visas. And so I wrote to both of them and they both wrote back and said, well, well done. You found the loop. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was legally not paying taxes you know i didn't have to pay any tax so uh and i hope and you were that, paid well uh, i i was paid quite well yeah 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 yeah. but basically the money i saved from that bought the hot springs bought the property where the hot yeah. springs is built <laughs> yeah so uh you know um thank you australia so and, how did and you Japan. meet so you were working side um, by side we uh, were working side by side yeah yeah i i and I, I i came into the office and you know said hello and um, you know, it wasn't uh, love at first sight like that, but basically, you know, but we, you know, you got on well as colleagues and um, it, it really, uh, where, where we, our relationship blossomed was when we managed to go on a, a, a skiing trip together and um, we were at a, um, um, uh, at, at a ski field, Nozawa Onsen. And it was, yeah, we were skiing together and she was a great skier. And I love skiing. So she, uh, you know, she was really good going through the bumps and, and I could see this spirit in her, that uh, this spirit and determination and this, you know, this, this, this real fight. And, um, and I, you know, I'd had another Japanese girlfriend before her um, not at that time. I was single at that time, but um, I had a, a Japanese girlfriend uh, the, the, before we got together. And um, I ended up breaking up with that girlfriend because I didn't think, um, you know, that she would have the strength to deal with me because I knew yeah. that, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit hard to handle. I'm not hard to handle in a bad way, but a hard to handle in that I'm, you know, I work very hard and I, yeah. and I you know, focus Keep on my job you. and, yeah, that kind of thing. And so when Yuki was, you know, skiing and she was keeping up with me on the bumps and, you know, we were going hard and she was there, you know, you know turn for turn, she was there with me. And, uh, and that really, uh, you know, it really made me think, wow, now that's the kind of spirit, you know, that kind of grit is uh, sort of what I'm going to need to have a, a partner in my life who can mm -hmm. put up with me and put up with, you know, the stories that I'm going to try and create in my life. And, you know, um, and uh, so that was, you know, that, that was it. And then we, and I think it was actually a similar thing for her, for me, because I, I, I ran a, um, a division at the, at the embassy, which was doing a, um, I was a project manager basically for Foodex, which was a food exhibition for Australian exporters trying to get into the Japanese market. And, um, it was the largest Australian exhibition, for, you know, foreign exhibition uh, in. Oh, lost you. 
so we had about 100 exhibitors, something like that, the food exhibitors from Australia trying to get into the Japanese market. And I had to work super, super hard at, at, at putting on this exhibition. Um, and I did it for a couple of years. And Yuki saw how I worked. And I think she was impressed the same way. She thought, wow, if you can work like that. Well it's, matched. It's, it's kind of, yeah, yeah, I think I, I, uh, I think so. So um, anyway, it's been a, a, a real journey together we had our son as we say conceived at the same time the hot springs uh, the knowledge of the hot springs was conceived and um you know he uh yeah so it's been a a, a life journey and you know I, I always like to think the analogy of a, a business is very much like a child um yeah you know and and their maturity and so forth is is very much like a child that they grow up but then they have their own personality and then they'll have their own existence and and once you get to a certain stage they don't need you anymore to to exist so you know how they will evolve will be you know with or without you may change a, a, a bit but um but basically they need a lot of care and nurturing and 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 things mm -hmm. in the early years and then um and then they're free to a certain extent. Um, so, you know, it, um, it's... Well, your life has nice. certainly been an example of wellness. I'm uh, delighted to, to flesh out the, the sketchy little pieces I picked up from our encounters <laughs> over the years and see uh, your, your real, uh, real inspiration, I think, for viewers to, uh, to see a, a wellness lifestyle uh, manifest. Uh, you have any parting wisdom to uh, pass on to future generations? We hope may uh, this, if this recording mm. survives. <laughs> uh, look, I I, uh, I I think um, probably the 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 it's looking at some of our um, our base philosophies I suppose as a business which relate to the things that we do in our lives and and that is um, you know whenever you whenever you're doing something I think you need to think of why you're doing it the purpose and mm -hmm. in, in in our cases you know and purpose for a business can be the same as for an individual and they should actually be resonating with yourself um, mm -hmm. at a personal level and as, as a business so in our case our our, our purpose is to co-create experiences um, that help people connect with themselves and each other and the environment. So, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with our hot springs, we really try and bring people in, in touch with each other and, and nature. Um, and, um, you know, I also love the idea of creating international understanding. I think, um, water and the the work that I, I do at various levels so you know while we have peninsula hot springs and that's our business we i'm also involved in a number of other organizations like um um you know the the global wellness institute hot springs initiative i'm the chairman of that and i'm involved mm. in femtech which is a, uh a, another federation of hydrotherapy and climatotherapy which is about balneology and and healing and health practices and water. Um, what was that? Uh, what kind of ology? Ba ba balneology. So it's a use of water and healing. So oh, uh, I don't know that word. Yeah, yeah, balneology. So yeah, water, water healing, and usually mineral waters or thermal waters. Um, uh -huh. And yeah, look that that organisation, Femtech, that Federation of Hydrotherapy and Climatotherapy. They've been going for you know, 85 years or something. It actually mm. came out of sort of Russia and the Eastern Bloc and has moved across. And we now have a representative in the United States. So I'm a representative in Australia. And uh, they've got representatives in, you know, 60, 50 countries or so. So China mm. and Japan and, um, you know, but it was only last year that we got uh, Vicky Nash, uh, to to be our uh, a represent our representative. I'm I'm you know, I'm 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 far away from the center of it, which is over in uh, in in Europe. Um, but um, it is a global organization, and I think really thinking about how can we find ways to connect um, is is important 
Um, and, you know, we, we like to create uh, international understanding through our hot springs and uh, through what we, what we offer. So I think uh, if you're, that has been a goal from the beginning. But if you look back and, you know, in 30 years' time, and I'm, I'm really intrigued to see, you know, where we've come from in the last, uh, you know, 20 years since we started, 1997, so 22 years, 23 years. And I'm really interested to see, you know, where will we be in the next 20 years? If I had 20 years, because it's like a, um, you know, like a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. Because you start off very small with an idea and it's gestating. And right now we are just on the cusp as an industry, both in Australia, you know, particularly in Australia, but globally as well, um, of a, a massive growth in this this thermal mineral spring industry. And I think if it can be done with a level of uh, consciousness and connection with each other, that, that this can have a really profound uh, influence on on communities and, and um, you know, just as a nice addition. When I say that, it's not going to change the world, but it will make things more comfortable. The, uh, the Dalai Lama, we asked him when he was in, at the Global Wellness Summit in India, um, we, when I say we, Mark Cohen actually asked him a question in the, in the crowd, from the crowd, and he said, uh, tell us about hot springs. And uh, he very profoundly said, ah, hot springs, they are quite comfortable. <laughs> and, and, and then he went on and he actually knew quite a lot about hot springs. And he, he knew about the minerals and the different effects of different minerals. And, and, and he had bathed many times. And, um, and in fact, I, after that conference, I went and had a lecture from his doctors in Dalamsala from on hot springs use in Tibet. So oh. that was, you know, th th they'd use it a lot, but he was very profound in the fact that he said they are quite comfortable. <laughs> and the fact that things that are so simple, the simple things are sometimes the best and finding comfort and relaxation and just a place to be, a comfortable place to be, is in fact a lot of what the essence of our lives are about. And our, we work so hard to find a place where we can be at comfort. And um, that's what he, he said. You know, there. So it was, uh, it was beautiful. Finding places of comfort is something that we... Uh, we uh, all need to seek to find our wellness, I think. Great summary. Well, Charles, this has been great. Uh, thank you for your wisdom and sharing it with whomever uh, gets to watch this. And uh, <laughs> I can't wait to get down there and see what all you've done. So I'm gonna end the recording now and thank you again. So, uh, oh.